Now 6.01, so we're going to get started. Um, Super. This Thank is the uh, third and final. You ready, Karen? Sure, it's on. This, this is the third and final joint, thanks to the weather, by the way, or we would have a meeting next week. Uh, this is the third and final joint Board of Selectmen Board of Finance budget hearing where we are listening to budgets uh, of the various town departments. Today, today is J Tuesday, January 31st. And with that, we can start with, I believe Christine Sullivan is here to present TPZ, ZBA, and I, IW, if it's so-called. So let's start with plan, town planning and zoning. Everything, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening. Everything in that particular budget is the same, except that we put in $30,000 because um, we have the mandatory update of the town plan of conservation and development. Um, it's anticipated that they'll be sending out a RFQ or whatever we call it um, so that they can hire someone to assist them with doing that. This is what they've done the last two times. Um, I did check with Tony and he said the last time the budget was somewhere between 60000 and 70000 for that particular thing. So we thought if we put in half now, we could always encumber something if it was necessary to carry it forward. Um, and then that would get us with the plan done on time. Other than that, everything remains okay. the same. So if you've got any questions, let me know. Okay. Any questions? I had a quick question about, um, are we talking about zoning the mm. TPZ now? Yes. Okay, yes. Because I know you're going to do several. Um, so zoning regulations being available either on the website or in the same system where our ordinances and our, um, our, our other documents are, uh, E-Code 360. Do you know if there's plans to do that now? Is that maybe something that can happen in the next fiscal year, the next That's budget? actually already been budgeted for in terms of getting it to a state where we have um, the zoning regulations in a single searchable document. Um, and we did uh, last year, no, I guess it was last year's budget. Uh, we had $10,000, or I think we spent eight, um, to have Glenn Chowder, who had assisted when they were going through the One Orchard Road <coughs> application. He was familiar with the zoning regulations. And he went through and he did a, a basic just uh, cleanup. So he was making sure that tables were there that weren't yeah. there um, and that it was more importantly all in one document because it was in individual sections. So right now the uh, town plan and zoning members are going through that just to make sure that how it's written is how they want it to read. They're just double checking to make sure everything <clears throat> makes sense. Um, and that should be going to public hearing later this spring so that then that will be in one document available online and um, that will be very helpful because then we can update very easily because it will be one document. And then also the more important thing for the average person will be that they can actually just search it. And so um, exactly. it will have features that will make it more user friendly. Right. So that right. is being done now as we speak okay so first it has to go to that public hearing tpz would then have to close the public hearing take action then you have a document then we have a document okay. yeah and I it's anticipated now. that after we do that then we'll probably be seeing some changes made to the zoning regulations in particular regarding housing the housing committee which i also work with um, has some suggestions that they'd like to see town planning and zoning adopt right. um, so they'll be meeting with them later this spring and once that document is easily able to be updated by me, then we can go forward with those. So those additional changes are separate from just <coughs> like correcting, right? Yes. And is that something that, is housing coming back to the Board of Selectmen to talk about those potential no, changes or? They may just as a courtesy, but since it's a zoning reg that they want to change, they would be going to town planning and zoning where it needs to be adopted. Okay. Well, either way, it'll all be, it'll it'll be all public hearings. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Moving on. ZBA. I see it's no change. So. It's no change. Any They've been very on? busy. Yeah. The only thing that I do caution you on that is we have, since we've come out of COVID, had to go back to doing online uh, published notices of the uh, things. So we're incurring more expenses because obviously the cost of 
legal notices has gone up um, and we are required to do that so that line item it's they've been busy this year we've been meeting almost every month so That's good okay no questions on that and then finally inland wetlands which once again is a it's the same as same exact it's budget been. Um, and <coughs> Anybody got questions? Any questions on inland wetlands? Okay. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Next is the town clerk, and I believe I see her with her mask on, which is the only way I know it's her. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <sighs> well, my budget. Um, we met with the Secretary of State last night, our new Secretary of State that's been in office four weeks, and she has a lot of plans for us this year, apparently. So I'm not sure that my budget projections are going to be the same as what happens in the next few months. Okay. She wants to do early voting, um, which is probably going to mean more money for both of our offices, the registrars and us, and we'll just have to wait and see. She wants the legislators to pass the early voting bill in March. Um, and I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if that's possible, but she has great plans. So um, I increased the general professional services a little bit. Um, we're in the process of scanning and re-indexing our land records back to 1784. We're now in the early 1800s. And with the extra money, I'd be able to go back all the way before I die. <laughs> so, so I would like to do that. Um, I lowered the uh, election budget somewhat because it's not a governor's or presidential election year, but we'll have the presidential preference primary coming up too besides the town election in the next budget. So we will need the extra money, um, some extra money. And I'm not, I really am not sure how much. Um, and they're looking to buy new machines uh, for the elections. We'll have to wait and see. I don't know how, how that's going to happen. It'll be either this year or next year. Hopefully it's this year and not in the presidential election year. But that's about it. Did you have any questions? Anybody? Is what it is. I just have a had a reason to go look at the original charter in the vault, and there it was, scanned already, no <coughs> parchment paper, totally readable. Thank you. <laughs> well, wow. it's it's a great it's a great history that we have in the town. And right. You're all welcome to come and see it. And it was great that it was so accessible. There's a lot there. So thank <clears throat> you. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is register our voters. Hello. Hi. Hello. So, um, let me preface the comments by saying that um, in the I, I, we had a, a small issue with the budget in that. Um, I didn't real in the last election, the presidential preference primary was in August, and I. I did not realize it was going to be back in April. So uh, I had to redo the budget today a little bit, and it increased by about a little over $2,200, which I presented to Tony. And he's shaking his head yes, which is good, because he agreed um, that that was reasonable. It, it only went up uh, a small amount because we were able to shave some money elsewhere, um, sharpen the pencil on the cost of elections. Um, fundamentally, the budget is so the ending budget will be about a little over sixty-three thousand dollars, roughly equal to what we expect to spend this year. Uh, the reason that it really hasn't gone up is because we have about the same activities occurring, with the exception of the presidential preference primary. It's a little cheaper to run because it's not a full, full-blown primary with all the offices. Um, I say a little bit cheaper. It's you know a few hundred, you know pr probably. Um, five to seven hundred dollars um, cheaper to run. Uh, other than you know, other than that, we'll basically have uh, budgeted for a municipal election, 
a presidential preference primary and hopefully one referendum <laughs> and a public meeting. So um, that's what's in the budget. Since um, so before I open it to questions, I do want to mention, uh, let's see what Anna wants to say, but Stephanie did mention early voting and it is sort of the elephant in the room. <clears throat> we haven't, in talking with Tony, we did not budget anything <coughs> for it with the understanding that if it happened, then it would have to be funded out of contingency. I did take a look at the, the proposal that the Secretary of State sent to the legislature. You may have seen it was a study that was done by a nonpartisan group, and it had what they called four models and what I would call one model with varying parameters. And uh, it basically varied from four days of early voting to 14 days of early voting, a wide range. And so I came up with a range of 15000 to $32,000, depending on, roughly-ish, depending on which parameters they pick. I don't know if you have anything you want to add. I, I do. I went to the technology committee meeting yesterday. Um, I'm sorry, it was today. But no. Thursday. Uh, t days are going by really fast when you get to this age. Um, <laughs> I went to the technology committee meeting and um, they don't really know what early voting is going to be. Originally uh, this proposal said in-person in voting for 14 days. Now we went to a meeting yesterday and they said it's going to be similar to when somebody comes in and says, I'm not going to be here for election day. I want to do an absentee ballot. And they fill out a ballot and they put it in an envelope. So, but that will happen not in the town clerk's office. It will happen, you know, in the polling location. So we will not have a tabulator. We're not going to be putting the ballots through the tabulator. At least this is what they're saying now. I don't really know what's going to happen. I do know that we're supposed to be getting a new voter registration system, which is going to mean additional training. So we did put a a, a, a considerable amount of money in there for training the staff for the new voter registration system. I don't know when that's coming through. Technology committee said the RFP has been done. They're just waiting to sign a contract on that. The um, other thing, if early voting does c come through, I think we should have a separate budget meeting, you know, with just for that because th we have no idea what that's going to con contain and how much it's going to be. So I think we're going to, I don't think it's going to happen this, this fiscal year. They're saying maybe 2024 now. There's a, there's a lot of training involved, there's a lot of software involved, there's a lot of changes to the procedures and, as well as the statutes, of course. And I just don't see it happening this year. We just don't even have time enough to train all the people that are required to do this. So I think it's going to happen in 2024. So I think we're going to have to put it off for now. Okay. There is a 50-page document or so. If anybody would like to look at it, I can forward it to you. <laughs> but I don't think that's the model that they're going to use. I think they're going to probably go with the envelopes. People will come in, do the voting, put an envelope, sign the envelope, and that'll be um, uh, secured until election day, and then they'll put through the way they are, put in absentee ballots. I think that probably would be the easiest way to start. Okay. Any other questions? I must say, after sitting in this seat as many years as I have, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I've never seen a line item increase of 29,900%. <laughs> I just want to acknowledge that now. If anybody out there is getting nervous, oh. it went from a dollar to 300. So Because we, we agreed, <laughs> Stephanie asked, a, asked me to take over the cost of legal ads <laughs> that are specific to the registrar's office. And that's what that is. I had to mention it. I saw that and I, saw, I, I looked to the left and I got, I, got, I got the shakes when I looked to the left and then I saw what it was. And, but that's a first. I don't think I've ever seen one that big. I don't know why there was one dollar in there previously, to be honest, but now we're doing it, so. Okay. Any other questions? No more to come, I'm sure, on the, the voting. Oh, yeah. It's going to be very exciting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, fire department. You'll be able to do some of these. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Good evening, guys. Even with the masks, we know who we're talking to, here, right? Oh. <laughs> Sean, fire, uh, fire chief. Um, so before we get going, our budget's going up quite a bit. It's going up over 12% this year. A lot of that's driven by inflation, uh, what things cost. Um, we're going to basically go by the bigger items that have gone up dramatically. Yeah. Um, and if you guys have any questions in between, just ask, and <clears throat> I'll try to answer them the best I can. If not, I'll get you the answers for them. Um, the first one is part-time maintenance. You're going to see a 100% decrease on that line item. And if you go down to 53100, cleaning custodial, basically what we did is we moved that money over into that line item. So even though it shows a 66% increase, it's not a 66% increase. All we did was combine two line items together. Um, medical expense, 52170. Um, basically, we have, to, we have to provide a physical every single year for every single firefighter and driver in the department. They're going to be going up 5%, uh, minimum 5%, they said, uh, as of July 1 along with EpiPens and medical supplies in that line in them, which is going to incorporate, that's, that's the increase for uh, in that line. Repair maintenance machine, as you all know, uh, we went to the Board of Selectmen last month, I'm, and the Board of Finance also got it. Um, we were asking for more money because we had some repairs done to the vehicles. Uh, we needed repairs done to the vehicles as of July 1 of this year, which we didn't anticipate, but on the average, we're probably, in the last two years, we've been pretty good, but uh, what we anticipate is spending roughly 97000 next year instead of eighty. Um, if you remember a few years ago, we were probably in the 120, 125 range. We replaced a piece of apparatus, so that brought the number back down, but 97000 is probably a realistic number where we're going to be next year. Um, so uh, that's where we show an increase in that line. Repair maintenance testing. So this does all the NFPA, OSHA inspections, yearly pump testing, hose testing, ladder testing, fit testing, meaning the every single firefighter needs to get fit tested with their air mask on and make sure it's the right size air mask. Uh, the Scott bottle testing, which is the breathing air the guys wear on the back of their, uh, on their backs to breathe in a fire. Uh, the air pack itself needs to be tested. All that is gonna be going up quite uh, substantially. It's going up at least 8%. I just want to make you guys aware of these numbers are really conservative. Um, we're in like a specialized field where <clears throat> we need to meet certain criteria. So even though inflation is probably around 70%, we're probably more in the lines of 10 or 12%. So I'm hoping the numbers are going to come down, but the numbers could actually increase by the time we get to July of uh, this year. And, uh, October when we do testing so these numbers could actually increase quite dramatically and we really don't have a choice we have to follow uh, these protocols um, uh, repair maintenance building is uh, we're looking for a 10 percent increase we're going from uh, 33,000 to 36,300 reason being is the 911 air vacs these are the these are the filters up in the bay and they need to be replaced. The filters need to be replaced, and they're thirty-six hundred dollars to replace the actual filter because there's a charcoal filter, a pre-emergent filter, and there's another filter in between it. And every few years we have to replace that. Last time we replaced it was about twenty-two hundred. We got a price this year, um, and it's over thirty-six hundred dollars. So it's quite substantial, and we don't really have a choice. We need to do it. Otherwise, you're bringing it, breathing in the carcinogens, and we have to meet a certain air qu uh, quality in the bay. So if you ever go into a firehouse and you see the hoses connected into the trucks, when they turn the trucks on, it takes the diesel fumes and it takes the um, smoke and the carcinogens and everything and blows them outside. When we built the firehouse, we decided to go with these air vacs, which are actually better because it's less maintenance. So if those hoses connect onto the tailpipes of the trucks, when you drive out, they're supposed to eject. There's a sensor that ejects. The problem is a lot of firehouses have issues with them. That's why we didn't go with them. As you drive out, sometimes they get connected and you rip the system down and you have to bring somebody in to reinstall it and fix it. So 
even though we have to replace these filters every three or four years, it's well worth doing that rather than having to try to fix a system like that. So that's the increase there. Software maintenance. Software maintenance is gonna be a big one, guys. It's gonna go from 25,000 to 41,000. Reason being is uh, toward the end of last fiscal year, May, June, uh, the town insurance company required us or in basically forced us basically to uh, have cybersecurity. So that included uh, Fortinet Sentinel-1, VMware, dual authentication, all that has a yearly subscription and that's all going up. So we're looking, we're going from 25,000 to 41,000. So it's showing a 64% increase on that line. But that's all based, that's all driven based on a lot of that uh, so, uh, software that is needed for cybersecurity. Rentals and equipment. That's the dumpster, a couple other things, all that. We've been told that there's gonna be an increase in that line item. Uh, dumpsters are gonna be going up as of July. They actually went up. So um, we're gonna be dealing with that. Communications telephone, there's a uh, slight increase there of 5%. That's the fax line, the general phones at the firehouse, uh, everything associated with that. Communications pager, e-dispatch, I, I am responding, Zello. So all that is how we communicate with the firefighters when there's an actual emergency. They get a tone over uh, their pager, they get a tone over their telephone, and they get a text message. All that is increasing due to demand, and I, I can't even tell you why they're increasing it, but they have the ability to, and we really don't have a choice, so I don't have a great explanation on that. Radio, communications radio, so um, we're going up 5.76%. This line basically encompasses the, the main radio system that we replaced probably about four or five years ago. This has to do with fire, police, and public works. This is the actual maintenance contract, um, the generator service, the fiber optic lines that go to each site, the generators, uh, power to each site that we have to pay, the diesel and fuel for the generators along with the propane, uh, and any repairs that are associated with that. So that line is pretty much, even though it's on our budget, it's basically split between, or should be in the three departments, but it's on us, under us, and we, we cover that um, price. And I believe this is the last year for the, uh, con uh, under the contract for Motorola. So we have to negotiate that come next year. <clears throat> Communication security. What that line is, is it's a monitoring inspection service, town hall, public works, the center building, the firehouse, and the old firehouse. That's basically the card access system that's at these buildings. We have the brains of it. We have to pay for subscriptions, updating, and everything else. So basically, as the system has grown throughout the years, we've been covering it, and now it's got to the point where <clears throat> the system's getting a little bit older, which is okay, but we're also not just covering the firehouse when this was originally uh, set up, but now we're covering town hall, public works, the center building, the firehouse, and the old firehouse. So we're covering much more than what we were originally. Office supplies, um, pretty self-explanatory why that's going up. Technical, these are the everyday supplies that we use on the road. This is speedy dry water, foam, all materials that um, if we go to an accident scene, if we go to a structure fire, if we go to whatever it is, this is all, um, this is all covered under that line item. So that line's going up. Uh, foam has already gone up almost 15%. Uh, speedy dry has gone up over 12%. Uh, drip pans have gone up over 8%, so there's quite a bit, of, it's quite a bit of an increase um, going up on that line. And I, ju I just hope that that's enough and hope where we hit a peak and we're going to come back down, but I'm not sure. Gear replacement. So this line's going up 16%. It's going from 30 to 35,000. This is actually a pretty good line to go up. And the reason being is we actually gained three new firefighters. 
so we have to outfit them with gear this year and we also have a gear replacement so gear has a shelf life of 10 years so every 10 years it, it could be sooner depending on how active the firefighter is if they go into a fire and the gear turns red we have to replace it immediately because the fire retardant has come off of it but this is this is something we need to we need to replace firefighting gear every 10 years we don't have a choice on this but what's good about this line is we actually gained three new active firefighters this year so it's a good thing for the town <clears throat> tires this this line item is going up because of cost increase for tires so we're going from 8500 to 14,000 we have to replace the tires on all emergency apparatus every seven years so even though the tires may some of the tires may look brand new you'll look at them they're in good shape they look really good what happens is fire trucks have a they're they're always on duty so seven days a week 24 hours a day 365 days a year they have weight on them all the time day and night where a dump truck you use it eight ten hours a day you're using it hard you're dumping it it goes and sits you're not leaving a load in the dump truck all the time so what happens with fire apparatus the tires get strained they have wear and tear they get dry rot every seven years they want you to replace the tires so usually when we replace tires we usually take them off and see if public works needs them if they fit their trucks we usually give them down there and let them use them until they run off the tread on the tire because the it's a fire apparatus is more um wear and tear for hours than it is actually mileage so the tires are actually in pretty good shape but we can't we can't uh we can't leave the tires on more than seven years so when we buy tires we have to look at date codes so we don't want a date code where a tire's been sitting six months or a year because now we just lost the that time frame off of what it is so we're really cognizant about uh looking at that gas and gas um this is the gas oil diesel that we use for um uh the trucks so that has gone up 18 18.4 percent this is based on the numbers we got from tony from finance uh, where we're going to be next year electric and buildings we're pretty much the same we've gone up a little bit natural gas has been a big one so that's going up 113 percent so we're going from 15,000 to 32,000 reason being is um so and i'm sure i don't know how many departments you you've talked about this but our that our natural gas the supplier of natural gas is going up two and a half times what we're spending and that's basically we i guess that's a locked in rate correct and we don't really have a choice on where we are so um that's where we are on that water uh we've gone up uh from a thousand to fifteen hundred because there is a increase in rwa come this year hydrants there's at least at least a seven and a half percent coming july one so meaning these are the hydrants so we own the hydrants in town uh we're responsible for the hydrants in town all we have all we're doing is we're paying we don't pay for metered water but we're paying for access to the water for the hydrant so right now we're paying uh 99,382. uh 99, we're going up to 106 835 minimum and they can't guarantee that's where it's going to stop it could go to 10 or 12 percent so that's a line we really don't have a choice with it's already dictated cap capital machinery um so capital machinery it's the minute replacement the pagers the guys wear on the side of their uh belts to notify them when there's a call we we usually keep that in there and we do a minute or replacement so every probably six seven years we end up replacing a few minutes each year as they break or have issues um and then the other thing in there is the wire wi-fi access points for the building so this is something we need to do the wi-fi at the building has failed and we need to replace it at the building uh we contacted tbng tbng came in and gave us a proposal and it's roughly fourteen thousand dollars to replace the wi-fi within the building which we need to do because if anybody's in the center of town right now um 
Verizon service is bad and you can't log in remotely. You can't <clears> log <throat> in if you bring a laptop or whatever remotely, you have to actually plug into the uh, building uh, hardwired because the Wi-Fi is just down, it's broken. Are there any questions on the budget? Once again, I apologize. It's a big number to come up with. I don't think I've ever sat here and told you it's going to be a, over a 12% increase. And I think these numbers are really conservative, to be honest with you. And if you do cut anything, I would definitely figure contingency into this because I think these numbers are, 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 are low. And I think even if we fund this, I would, I would hope... I, all I can tell you is I hope you guys would put enough in contingency to cover if anything goes up because it doesn't look like things are coming down. If anything, what we're hearing on our end, especially in the fire service, everything is, is going up. It's not coming down or it's not even staying where it is. And no one can guarantee us where we're going to be in six months or seven months. I, I have a question. It's not so much budget related, Sean, but I know you keep careful track of the number of calls you guys get and where you are. I don't have that, but I can get that for you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, remember, I think it's about 400 or something. Say again? I think about over 400 or so calls, 450 and calls is that for the year. From part of the prior year? Are you it's actually, it's actually right around, it's about average right now. Oh, we had okay. some years that were, were 600 plus. Okay. Uh, so we're about average, about 450 or so. Um, but I don't have that exact number to okay. give you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one other question. Sure. <laughs> every Susan, year, you're full of questions. I'm always full of questions. Full of something, anyway. Yeah. Um, every year you always amaze me with, with how many hydrants we actually have in this town. Am I right if I say 108? 137. 137. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I just think it's remarkable. So when we look at it, so you get excited, every time, over, you get excited over hydrants. Or <laughs> you know? Okay. Uh, she had no idea. We do <laughs> actually talking about hydrants. It's a funny thing. We're we're trying to create something. We're going to be trying something this spring about how to paint the hydrants in an efficient way. But come next year, if it doesn't work out, we may have to look at how to sandblast the hydrant and. And paint them because some of the hydrants around town are pretty, pretty bad, in bad shape. So we're going to try something this year. We can look at that too. We're open to ideas, so they have to be, they have to be scraped down. I think Karen Kravitz should lead that up. Paint them different colors. We can do colors. We can do rainbows. You learned that in law school. Whatever we, whatever we want. law school. <laughs> there you go. After you maybe, do one year, like, no, this isn't for me. Susan, adopt maybe we can have an adopt a hydrant program. Yeah. You could have your own hydrant. Huh? Matt, I think you and Susan should lead that up. I think I'll we'll support that. you any way I can. I, I get, I'll, I'll go to the I'm Board of Finance and ask for money. I'm almost as excited about hydrants as you. It's so when you look at it, 10% yeah. of the town is on hydrant. We have hydrants in 10% of the town. 90% yeah. we're trucking water in. That's why when people say, oh, Woodbridge has big trucks, we have to have big trucks. Right. So you got to have tankers. You're having, uh, you're carrying a lot of water. We're carrying probably 15,000 water, yeah. gallons of water at a shot where Orange has hydrants everywhere except for one road that butts Woodbridge. And yeah. that's, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. So... Okay. You think they should That's be Dalmatian colored, you know, white and black. Yeah. <laughs> I think oh, I think you guys are all on to something. I'll, I'll, I'm on it with you, Susan. <laughs> all right. Anything else of value? Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 you <laughs> Nothing. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Imitate. Okay, we are. Uh, Twenty minutes ahead of time. Amity, are you ready? We are. Amity. Give me a second to put the on. Sure.
a blank. Yeah, Mine's on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got it yet. Yeah, it's a blank. Actually, though. It's a difference. Yeah, that's why I think it's a blank. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's right. That's right. Oh, you're the inside guy. So you get to see the presentation again, right? It's just more paper. Thank you. Pile stops here. Okay. Everybody uh, settled in? <laughs> okay. Would you like the lights down? Uh, I mean, it may be easier for you to see. Um, you can just put maybe those guys too down. Dimmed a little bit. Might help a little for you. Yeah. Yeah, shut them both. No, put them down. Shut them both. Them. The rest of the room. Yeah, there we go. Okay, perfect. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. And I did look at your agenda online. Well, I appreciate that you're well ahead of schedule. I also saw that you had an estimated 8 o'clock start time, stop time. So um, I will try to move through this as quickly as possible. Um, I am going to skip some slides, but I would encourage people, if they are interested, to uh, watch the video of either the Board of Finance, or sorry, the Amity Finance Committee meeting from January or the upcoming board meeting. That will be on February 13th, because I'll go into um, the detail that I'm going to skip over this evening. Uh, most of that detail is around our um, report on the state of the schools. Uh, so our bylaw does require us to uh, provide an update for um, uh, where we are finding that we have some su success and are making progress and having some good academic and athletic and arts outcomes. I'm going to kind of just skip over most of that tonight um, in an effort of saving time, but if that is something that I know um, if you've read papers, we've been criticized uh, for not maintaining our high academic excellence. And I have data in the presentation that I think will prove uh, that it, uh, the contrary to that. Um, so again, um, those of you who have seen me before, uh, you do know that um, we look at the three A's of Amity, our academics, which like I said, just going to skip through, um, our athletics, and our arts. Um, I do want to focus a little bit on district priorities. Again, this is part of our bylaw that we focus on what our priorities are. Um, it's very refreshing this year. We finally have data from the state, from our state accountability report that has actually helped us to guide where our district priorities are. In addition to that data, we use our school climate data. We use um, our principals, councils, and um, our conversations that we have with students. We use our PTSOs, so we have conversation with, conversations with parents to help guide where our strategic priorities are. But I do want to, um, to emphasize that uh, this year, for the first time in at least two years, we've been able to go back to the data that we have to identify the places where we have the most needs. I'll also put a plug in that if you are at all interested in the Amity Musical, tickets will go on sale probably next week, so keep an eye out. It is Beauty and the Beast this year, so it will be a popular production. All right, so um, just jumping right into our budget overview. Um, we're, of course, guided by um, general uh, statutes, uh, and they expect that regional school districts make an estimate of our receipts and expenditures for the next fiscal year, as well as an estimate for the receipts and expenditures for the current fiscal year. Um, we highlight the word estimate because I want to emphasize that we start the budget process in October for a budget that ends about 18 months later. And we have moving parts that come into our school every single day, about 2,200 of them. And those kids move in, they move out, they change, their families change, what is happening in their lives change, and so our response to them also is constantly evolving. Our, our budget is guided by our board's mission as well as our goals. These have not changed, at least in the four years <coughs> since I've been here in Amity. Um, and so these continue to be our guiding focus. But what we've added is the BOA portrait of the graduate. So de developed collaboratively with feedback from people across all three of our uh, sending towns, 
um, including our elementary parents, including business leaders, including uh, secondary uh, college admissions um, uh, officials. We developed the portrait of the graduate or our vision of what we believe we should be graduating when they leave Amity and move out into whether it's our community or to the greater world. Our budget process, like I said, begins in October. We start with all the things that we have to do, um, contracts, <coughs> mandates, and then the department request is really the one discretionary um, side of things. We really look to try to find places where we can cut and trim. Um, this is my recommended budget. Um, it comes to the finance committees and the AFC for feedback, so that way we can present it to the board with information from all of you. Ultimately, the board adopts it before it goes out for a uh, referendum. So budget drivers, not surprisingly, commodities and inflation is a budget driver. I'm going to guess this is a storyline you are hearing repeated over and over as budgets are presented to you this year. Um, contracts are always um, an impact on our budget. Uh, healthcare costs, pupil services, which is um, more commonly known as special education services, technology, uh, personnel requests, the revenue actually offsets the budget, and then actually our budget this year is driven by what I would say is essentially a level enrollment, although you're going to see the town fluctuations in overall enrollment and the impact that it has on Woodbridge. So commodities and inflation, just a quick overview, um, and I think the inflation number is old because I'm pretty sure I heard on the news it was hovering around 8% um, as of last week. But overall, obviously, inflation um, is up. You feel it in your own homes and with your own personal budgets. Uh, the places that really impacts us, technology products are anywhere from 5 to 20% higher than they were at this time last year. Um, food costs, um, which also, if we use the example from our culinary programs, but this just includes general supplies, whether it's art supplies, the cost of construction materials for our CTE classes, um, all of those are up about 75 to 8%. Paper goods, which we use in abundance, as you can see by the very thick budget book that you have sitting in front of you, is up anywhere from 5 to 40%, probably on the higher end. Um, our utilities are anywhere from 15 to 36% up. And we also have a couple of unfunded state um, mandates that we have to address, including um, the provision of free feminine hygiene products to all of our students and an HVAC inspection for all three of our schools that's extremely specific about what has to be done and who has to do it. That inspection does not include whatever they find that then has to be fixed. So when you look at our budget, um, about two thirds of it is in um, our human resources, the benefits and salaries of the employees that we have working in the school district. Um, special education is a federal mandate. We really do not have any options when it comes to that green wedge, that's special education. Purchase services are some of the things that we have to um, go out to contract for because we're a regional school district. So um, the Beecher um, driveway probably gets plowed by somebody from the town um, or somebody that the town is contracting with when it snows. We have to have our own snow plow contract. Um, there's somebody who's cutting the grass at the schools um, they are likely employed by the town, even if it's just through the school budget, but we have a contractor for our buildings and grounds. So we, so there's a lot of things that we have to do that for um, air, uh, local schools, that's oftentimes um, kind of contained inside of the town budget. Um, text and supplies, which is where people oftentimes, you know, tell us to trim the budget and cut it down, is only a 6% of the wedge. And again, the textbooks are not really a negotiable item. We have to have those resources to teach our children. And then debt service is going to be the service, um, again, that regional school districts carry because we are allowed to take out our own um, bonds. And that's not something that you would typically see with, say, the Beecher school budget. Um, just to point out, and you'll see later, we're asking for a 2.93% increase. Um, our contractual increases are 2.92. So I always, again, contracts are negotiated well in advance. The fact that we can come in right about at that exact same spot means that we're actually making reductions in all those other pieces of the pie that I showed you, while that, that, one, that, that piece of pie, that salary and benefits, is actually going up by the same amount that, that we're asking for in terms of a budget increase. Uh, health insurance, we maintain a reserve. Uh, we're self-insured, so we maintain a reserve of 18%. 
our insurance consultants um, consider this to be somewhere between the low and moderate, so we are not being incredibly conservative um, with our um, reserve. We are assuming some risk there, but we have evidence and several years of data that indicate that that's probably a safe um, bet to, to make. Um, we do get more volatility in claims because we're considered a small organization. Um, but um, so far, we have managed to, to maintain this um, reserve and to feel uh, confident in that decision. Um, we did ask our medical advisor to compare self-insurance to the state plan, which is kind of the cheapest option, um, to see if it continues to be beneficial for us to be self-insured. And they did an analysis and found that um, since 2018, we've saved about $4 million by continuing to maintain self-insurance as opposed to going out to the state partnership plan. Uh, pupil Services Department, um, part of the reason why they are such a large budget driver is because this is a list of everything that they do and that comes under Pupil Services. It's a pretty exhaustive, extensive list. It includes nursing services, um, many of the um, services that our students receive, like occupational and physical therapy, we deal with Medicaid reimbursement. We provide um, a, a psychological so, uh, support services for our students. We uh, pay attention to homelessness, students who are placed as a result of DCF. We are all the, t uh, they, they cover all the title compliance um, coordination, uh, transportation for all of the students who receive special education. So it's a pretty um, extensive uh, department uh, run by just a couple of people. Um, our student enrollment in um, what we call identified students uh, has been going up um, over the past uh, six years. You can see that um, while the enrollment is changing, our overall enrollment has also been decreasing. So the percentage of our students who are identified as needing either a 504 plan or an individualized education plan has actually increased from about 25% to about 30%. In other words, one in three students has some kind of service, either through um, 504 or through the Individuals with Disabilities Act. So that also drives our budget when you consider that many students are receiving some kind of special supports. Um, our major um, impactors are rising outplacements. These are students who come to us from the elementary districts, out of district uh, schools are very expensive. They move to us, they come off the books for the elementary district, we put them on our books for Amity. Uh, they also come with tuition and transportation. We also have some students that continue to receive services in district, but they require specialized personnel. <coughs> These include behavioral therapists. We have one student who's medically fragile that will require a one-to-one -one nurse. We also have some students who have in their um, plan a one-to-one uh, -one paraeducator. That's not typical of a middle and high school, but uh, sometimes the needs of the student do actually drive that. Um, we are also looking to add a special education tutor due to um, increased enrollment in one of our specialized programs. And we often have legal services that are a result of parents challenging the special education services that we are providing for their students. Um, I do want to highlight that we run uh, three um, in-district programs. Our Transition Academy, which is at UNH Orange and Albertus Magnus, serves our students ages 18 to 22 who need services beyond their 18th birthday or what would traditionally be their graduation. Um, we have our Sales Academy, which provides support in grades 7 through 12 for our most cognitively disabled students. Uh, we teach life skills and we focus on basic living skills that will enable those students to hopefully live independently at some point in their life. Um, and then we have um, our new Spartan Prep program located at the middle school in Bethany and at the high school. This is for our students who have um, significant um, emotional needs, who need um, specific clinical mental health, health counseling and services to help them uh, regulate within the regular school setting. Um, that is our newest program. What we've done is we have um, estimated that if we put all of these students into a rest out of district schools, so REST would be ACEs or CES run by the state and are the lowest cost out of district placements. If we had put all those students there, if we had provided transportation, sometimes all on the same bus, sometimes they have to be on different buses because of the needs they have, um, we would be adding an additional $1.9 million to our budget as opposed to running these programs in district. 
Um, so we've been slowly building these programs over the year. It's required the addition of teachers at times when it looked like enrollment was going down, but it still saves money for the taxpayer if we can keep our students in district. It's also better for kids if they are taught with the children that are in the neighborhoods where they go to school, that they, that they are better part of their community outside of the school walls. Overall, um, even though it is a budget driver, um, our pupil services budget is down um, almost 11% um, from last year, or well, from the current uh, year. And a big piece of this is because we have been able to return students from out of district placements back into these specialized programs that we have in our schools. We knew we were eventually going to be able to do that, and this is the year where we're actually actualizing that and realizing a savings um, to the overall budget. We still have fiscal uncertainties with pupil services. Excess cost right now is estimated at 70%. We don't have a reason to believe that's changing, but certainly it does from the state perspective when they finally uh, reimburse us. Um, we still have 29 students that don't fit our in-house programs. Uh, so they are in some of those more expensive out-of-district placements, and their placement and transportation can change at any time based on their needs. Um, we continue to see student mobility of kids moving in and moving out, and then moving back in and back out of the district sometime all within the course of one school year. And if we don't anticipate those students, they can come at a fairly significant cost. And then we also oftentimes get um, recommendations in the springtime from the elementary districts. Um, sometimes for out-of-district placements, sometimes for specialized programs. Um, and I think a lot of that um, is that we hit a transition year between 6th and 7th grade and people make some decisions about the education that is best for students. And so that sometimes occurs in the springtime. We maintain uh, weekly contact with the special education directors in the three elementary districts to make sure that we're always on top of where those kids are going and what's happening to them. And we do make budget adjustments right up to the point that the board adopts the budget so that we are really, truly um, uh, trying to be as accurate as possible with um, our, our out-of-district placements. Uh, technology, as um, many of you know, when we went uh, into a pandemic a couple years ago, we went to become a one-to-one -one district. It's now become ubiquitous with how we teach and learn in our schools. And so now we have the challenge of maintaining that one-to-one -one environment. Uh, we're learning a lot more about the devices, about how, our student, how they hold up to our wear and tear by our students, but also how we can support students to use them appropriately. So we do see some shifts coming in our one-to-one -one plan. It's just not there yet. Um, therefore, we need to continue to pay for the leases on the uh, lease payments on the devices. Endpoint protection and classroom management is non-negotiable. It's what helps us to keep kids doing the right things on the devices as opposed to the wrong things on the devices. And it allows our teachers to, um, to attend to what the students are doing. And then when you have um, laptops, you can't just sort of function with just the laptop. I have a laptop here. I also have a projector, an HDMI cord. I have a clicker if I was standing here. So when you have these one-to-one -one devices, they come with peripherals. And those are also some of the cost. In addition to that, we continue to have specialized labs. Um, we need software for teaching in the one-to-one -one environment, and we are really dependent at this point on instructional displays. Um, what I'm using right now isn't an instructional display, just a projector and a computer. We are being very careful at making sure that whatever display we select for the teachers is the one that's appropriate for how they use it in the classroom. Some teachers need Promethean boards because of what they teach that's predominant in math and science. Other teachers can get by literally with like a really big screen TV because all they're showing are slide presentations and videos. So we're trying to make those instructional displays match to the instruction that's occurring in the classroom. What we did do is take another look at a five-year technology plan um, to try to make sure that we're not asking for 40 Promethean boards all in one year or five specialized labs all in one year. Much like we've approached facilities and textbooks, we're trying to stretch that out over a five-year period, being proactive so that we can keep that portion of the budget relatively level. Um, personnel fiscal impact, I will go through um, fairly quickly. Um, basically, we are asking to um, add 1.6 teachers. Um, we are also able to reduce a teacher, really due to enrollment. Um, 
at the high school level, when you lose, you know, 30 kids, it doesn't mean you can reduce a teacher, but over time, as you lose 30 kids every few years, you're able to look at content areas and departments and say, you know what, we really don't need 12 teachers, we can get by with 11. We made reductions in social studies last year, this year we see an opportunity to make a reduction in English. Um, we do have five positions that were funded over the course of the last three years with the ESSER monies. Um, we were very careful when we funded those five positions to never fund them at 100% and to always very slowly be absorbing their um, salaries back into our operational budget so that when the monies finally ran out, which is this year, we wouldn't be asking for five new positions, we're asking for 1.3. Um, so those are five existing staff members, most of them in areas of um, student mental health and support services. Um, we have to um, add two paraeducators, but we believe we can reassign one, and the other will actually be re reimbursed by the school um, district that the student is coming from because they are not a Bethany Orange or Woodbridge uh, resident. Um, I mentioned that we needed an additional special education tutor for our seven to eight sales program. We have an increase in enrollment of our cognitively disabled students at the middle school level. We really need another uh, teacher uh, or tutor in that program who can help us with instruction. We're looking to add a district in school suspension tutor and then a um, half time administrative assistant. I do want to highlight the math interventionist. Um, because this is one of the areas that our accountability report shows that uh, we need to provide support. We are struggling in terms of math um, uh, progress from year to year. This is not an Amity thing. This is actually something that you see statewide as a result still of achievement gaps um, from the pandemic. Currently, we have two paraeducators who provide intervention to our students in the middle schools, so one in each middle school. Um, they do it under the direction of our actual math teachers. And then with our Besser monies, we had actually added an additional person in each of the middle schools. So you can think of it like we have one seventh grade math para and one eighth grade math para in each middle school. We know those ESSER positions are going away. Um, the proposed model is really modeled after what we've done for years in reading services, which is actually hiring a teacher. Somebody who is experienced in direct instruction in math who comes with a math content background to provide the intervention to our students. Now, trying to be mindful of the budget impact and knowing that we have two middle schools, our proposal is really to hire one teacher and to maintain one paraeducator. And basically, they would swap. So on the days that the teacher is in orange, the paraeducator would be at Bethany Middle School, and then the next day they would trade places. So that way we provide consistency for our students. We provide intervention by people who are the most skilled in delivering it, but we also do that without having a huge significant impact on our budget and on the taxpayers. The other position I want to highlight is the in-school suspension tutor. And so the board has really taken a hard look at refocusing on our student conduct and discipline policy. And um, the state has really set down an expectation that suspending kids out of school doesn't actually change behavior. You're basically giving them a vacation and you're not actually providing any sort of intervention to change the behavior. So we really have seen an increase in the number of in-school suspensions over the past few years, and definitely with a return back to COVID, you can just listen to the news and hear stories about children and students making poor choices. There were like three of them on the news as headlines yesterday, and it's Amity's not immune to that either. Um, what we currently do is um, in-school suspension is a teacher duty at the high school. But at the middle schools, we don't have anybody to provide that. So a kid at the middle school literally just gets sort of moved from office to office. Sometimes they're sitting in the main office, sometimes in a conference room, and maybe they go to the counseling office the next period. It's just kind of whoever is available. And so um, what we're proposing is hiring one person and having one place where everybody who has in-school suspension would come and work with a certified teacher who can then provide not just um, some instructional support for the schoolwork that they're doing, but also some direct instruction in terms of um, making good choices and how we change our behaviors. Um, it's likely that that, that that location will be at our district office, so it's not favoring one school over another. We have talked with the bus companies already about making sure we could provide transportation for middle school kids to the district office if we had to. 
we've cleared it with our legal counsel, so they say it's, it's you know, something that other school districts certainly do. Um, and uh, we've had, if you look at our data, 70 out of 180 days, we have at least one kid in in-school suspension from last year. And some of those days, you could have as many as four. That doesn't include the kids who are in in-school suspension for a partial day. So they make a knucklehead decision during the second period, and you say, ah, you're in in-school suspension for the rest of the day. That's, that data doesn't include those students. So we would be using this person pretty much on an almost daily basis, but on the days we really don't have any kids in in-school suspension, they would be reassigned as a substitute at the high school where we are constantly desperate for finding people to cover classes when teachers are absent. Um, we do have about um, almost a million dollars that comes in in revenue. Um, it can range from um, you know, very small things like ticket sales for some of our athletic events, but the most um, important source of revenue is our excess cost. This is the amount that the state reimburses us for special education students who cost more than four times the amount of, um, of our special education student. This number's actually gone down because as we return kids to our in-district programs, they don't exceed the excess cost threshold anymore. So it's a number that over time, it is one of the, the downsides of running very successful in-district programs. But the amount that it has gone down has never offset how much it would cost if we were sending those kids to out-of-district schools. Um, our ADM, average daily membership, this is how we determine um, the allocations for the towns. Um, so we use the ADM from um, this uh, current October to do the allocations for next year's budget. Um, you can see the shift. Um, it, overall, we're, we're actually increasing um, in terms of um, enrollment. We project that we're going to be at 2,178 students for next year. But basing it off of ADM, you can see that we've had slight decreases in both Bethany and Woodbridge, um, but a really big decrease in Orange. Um, and so that's going to drive the budgets um, and how the allocations work out for the towns um, with the 2.93 um, that's proposed. Um, Can you just pause on that? Can you go yep. back? So I just wanted to point out, it looks though, as though we're going down six students, but our percentage increase is going up. Because and Orange has just, decreased so much. Right. So we'll yeah. be paying more even though we're sending fewer students. So it's something yeah. that yeah. our our two boards have to really understand how that works. It's every single student makes a difference. Yes. Yeah. Um, in your budget book, we have a capital improvement plan. Um, we do just want to um, highlight a couple of the things that we're working on. Um, actually, right now, we are, have already dived into our contingency to repair the back door at the high school. It's a safety concern, and it can't be ignored any longer. So that's a kind of not in the capital plan anymore. Um, we are also going to hopefully use end of year funds to repair the front patio at the high school. Um, our kids eat lunch there almost every day that it's nice. It is in absolutely dilapidated condition. And we just built two beautiful new outdoor classrooms at each of our middle schools for students to eat at from the middle school level. So we would like to make an improvement for our high school students. Um, probably um, the thing that um, that I'm most interested in because as much as I love concrete and asphalt repair, it you know really doesn't do a whole lot for me, um, is going to be um, refurbishing the media center at the high school and really turning it into a modern day media center. It pretty much looks the way that it did back in um, the 90s when the school was updated. Um, so lots of books and not a lot of technology. Um, and then you, you'll also see in the five-year plan a plan to do that for our middle schools, but just a little bit further down. Um, we also have um, long-term um, plans in place, uh, looking at um, doing some upgrades onto athletic um, areas. And again, we continue to recognize that we will have to replace the stadium field at some point, and we can either set aside small amounts of money every year to do that, um, so that way into our CNR account, so it doesn't come as a big expense all at once when we have to do it. Um, or we can continue to delay it and then have a much larger cost that we would have to work into the budget at some point. Um, we also do five-year plans for technology and textbooks, and the thing that I would like to point out the most is about two or three years ago, we did a significant upgrade to our infrastructure. 
Um, I heard somebody talking about wireless access points. We needed, and I can't even tell you how many we have, but um, pretty much every classroom has one. Um, but we needed wireless access points, we needed new servers, we needed new wires, and it cost about $2.3 million at that time. Um, technology has a shelf life of about seven to eight years before it just starts to collapse. And we realized that rather than coming to everybody, and it, you can't bond it because it actually goes out of date and kind of cooks and fries before you even finish paying off the bond. So it's not a really bondable item. So we have recognized that at some point we're going to have to go through this major upgrade to our, our infrastructure again. And rather than coming and asking for a 2.3 or whatever inflation makes it at that time, um, but several million dollar technology infrastructure upgrade, beginning with the 24-25 budget, we'd also like to consider setting aside money so that we're able to do that technology upgrade when it comes without a significant impact um, to an overall budget increase. So that's part of that technology five-year plan. Um, it kind of aligns with debt service that it is decreasing. We haven't taken out bonds for a while, and this is kind of paying off from the largest bonds that we had in the district. So you can see that the debt service starts to decrease rapidly. Um, I know folks are eyeing that as a great opportunity for um, perhaps having lower Amity allocations. Um, but again, we're considering um, our infrastructure. I would also encourage um, members of both boards to look on, um, in the paper at any of the negotiated teacher contract settlements that are coming out. Um, they are double to three times higher than what we're currently existing under. And I can't envision that we're going to have something much different when we go to some of our contract negotiations starting <coughs> next year. Um, so I think that might be impacting how that debt service uh, gets freed up and used. Um, we do have that option to set aside up to 2% of um, anything that of, of our unexpended funds to put it into our capital non-recurring account. Um, our board has been very um, particular in making sure that whatever they set aside, they are identifying specific projects and not just setting aside money just to sort of save it. Um, so we have several projects, um, including roof replacements, working on um, improving our lecture hall, um, and um, doing some upgrades with HVAC and, and things like that that we have very specifically set aside money for and have used um, our CNR for those reasons. Our initial budget request came in at 5.12, which again is lower than normal, but um, uh, still far too high for me to come and present to you, so we made some reductions. Um, we went out in um, December with a memo to our um, AFC and to the board of a 3.58% increase, but then we continue to look for um, savings um, with some of our, um, uh, some of the major areas where we can make cuts, and that's how we have the 2.93% uh, for you tonight. In terms of town allocations, and this is what Ms. McCreven was alluding to, um, even though it's a 2.93% because of the student enrollment, it's about a $1.1 million increase for Woodbridge from the current year budget and about a half a million dollar increase for Bethany. Um, and then you can see Orange has a mod very modest increase of about $21,000. Um, just to give you some perspective, the uh, um, Connecticut Association of School Business Officers maintains a running document of current uh, superintendent budget requests. The average as of uh, yesterday is 4.85%. Um, the average for Dirt B schools, which is our district reference group, is 4.66, and our proposal is currently the lowest out of all of the Dirt B schools. And that is it. Um, you have a very thick budget book in front of you, and we are happy to answer questions right now. Uh, but the other thing that we've started this year, and I will make sure that Mr. Lofters um, has the link again, is we have a um, Word document where um, if you just send questions to Mr. Lofters, um, Terry and I will answer it in that document, and then everybody's able to see both the questions that are being asked as well as the answers that are being provided. So that way, you know, you, you might see a question that you didn't think of that you get a response to, or the question you ask somebody else might be interested in and they may look at your response. So while we're happy to, to do questions and answers now, um, I also know that you just took in a lot, you have a lot sitting in front of you, so we're more than happy to answer them later.
Anybody have a question right now? <clears throat> Dr. Byers, can you just tell us um, what the timeline looks like for uh, budget decisions, mm. right? So this is the superintendent's proposed budget, but the Amity Board of Ed hasn't even acted yet. Right? Correct, yeah. So um, so actually, the Amity Board of Ed hasn't even seen the budget. Um, <laughs> Except so, these two. <laughs> <laughs> we went out to um, uh, the Amity Finance Committee in January. Um, we are presenting, we've already presented to Orange Finance Committee last week. You're our second finance committee presentation. Um, and then on February 13th, the Amity Board of Education will see the budget for the first time. Hopefully with some questions answered from the finance presentations and any feedback. Um, what has to, and then we go to Bethany on the 14th. What has to happen is the Amity Finance Committee will make a recommendation that has to be made um, by the end of February. And the board um, will have to vote and approve a budget by March 15th. If for some reason what the board decides is not the same as what the finance committee recommended, we have some back and forth that goes on for a while until essentially the date of our um, public uh, meeting, which is the first week in April. Um, after the first week in April, we typically set a referendum date, and at that point, I can't advocate for the budget anymore. Um, so we sort of become very quiet at the school level, and it really becomes the board's budget for um, advocacy. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, where, where was that online with those the, the question? So right now, it's a document that I can share the link with Mr. Lofters. Um, we only started getting questions last week, so it was just a blank document. But now that we have questions, what we'll do is we'll be able to um, post it up um, onto our, we have a, a budget section on the Amity website. But what we should also be, we can also send the link to all of you so that you would be able to see it in kind of live time. I guess the w one other comment that I would make, and, and we did hear from the Woodbridge Board of Ed at our previous meeting, and um, one of the things that we constantly struggle with is the cost of these two separate school districts. So any efforts that you might be able to highlight uh, as you go forward and speak about your budget, where you're uh, sharing services or making agreements and um, you know, maybe sharing personnel or at least consulting or uh, helping between the two school districts, or I guess all four of the school districts, it, it seems like it's one of the few things that we can do to help keep costs down for taxpayers is to encourage the shared services. Well, I, you're, you're absolutely right, and I think, and Mary or Tony can actually talk about this, I and mean, even like the fuel bid, which I think we all jump into together, um, we have leverage and you know, power when we function as a group, and our, our Part of the reason why we went from, from 3.58 down to 2.93 is because we got an extremely favorable fuel bid and it changed what our projection was for our budget. Um, so it's, you know, it's opportunities like that too where we can kind of function together as a, as a group. Um, it helps us out. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. Anybody else? I got a quick question. I'm David Florida. Your budget versus what the final budget gets adopted. Is it usually more with the Board of Ed when they get through with their review? Or is it about the same or is it a little bit less? I'm just, um, just it's, curious. It's, it, it, in my years of experience, it's either been the same but tends to be a little bit less. It okay. is, I, they have never asked for, asked for more, more than more, what more I've presented. More than present. what you're, you're okay. What bridge? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Light. You want these extra? Talking about all the paper? Yeah, we would love that because we'll sure. just bring them to Bethany. <laughs> okay. So, or give them to the board. board. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good Thank night. you for coming. Good to see you guys. <laughs> okay, the rest of our presentation tonight is the Tony Genevieve Show. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you.
So Tony, you want to start with uh, government Board access? Of select. Or, are you doing government access? No, no, that's... Uh, oh, Poo is going to do it? Yeah. Oh, all right. I'm sorry, Poo. Poo Ford Show first. Poo yeah. Ford Show. Yeah. Poo, <clears throat> yeah, is this your swan song, Poo? Are you leaving us? Hello, I must be going. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we, you have a flat budget before you, and everything should work out the way it always has when you find somebody to do this job. Okay. okay. But in the meantime, you're going to be with us. Uh, I will hang around. You won't abandon us. I'm, ha I'm happy to train people. I'm happy to come back and fix things if they need fixing. Okay. Uh, tell you who to call when the fiber breaks in Milford and all the channels are dark. <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we started out with the DVDs on a carousel. I was, I started, I started out free here for you for the first eight months, and the job originally was supposed to be ten hours a month, I think it was, to cover three boards, and then there was a. Uh, efforts by the station in Bridgeport to make a regional government channel with all six towns. And it oh. became more important to have more boards. So now instead of selectmen and finance and education, Woodbridge education, we're, we're also we're covering like 12 to 15 things a month. So. Um, we couldn't do it without you, Pua. And some people, some people who are not getting recorded wonder, why, why, why aren't they getting recorded? So um, there are some people behind me who will work, you know, if they're available. So uh, if we just keep them coordinated with what's going on in town, um, we can keep people mostly happy, I hope. Okay, any questions for Pua? I do encourage you to keep up the uh, conference and, and uh, professional development, because if we can't pay our pros as pros, we can at least uh, find interesting things for them to do. And what I've learned, I'm not an engineer. I was a linguistics major. I read manuals a lot, um, and I read stuff online. And I go to conferences, and I learn from other people. So you may want to you know, make sure that you have money to send people to do that. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. It's been a pleasure, Paul. Hey, it's been fun. Okay, Anthony. Yes. As Father Gene would call you. <laughs> 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 Board of Selectmen. Okay. Uh, so for the Board of Selectmen budget, there's a number of uh, requested increases here, but there's basically the largest is uh, the legal fees for litigation, uh, based on the fact that we anticipate we're going to be having a lot of additional fees in that area in the coming year. I think that's probably no surprise to anybody here. No. Um, the uh, printing and binding cost is for uh, pr mainly for printing costs, paper costs related to the newsletter that has uh, increased, that is uh, sent out uh, 10 times a year. And um, finally, the um, the town meeting expense and the other purchase services is just um, uh, additional cost uh, that we're incurring for uh, things that we've always um, purchased out of those accounts. They're just costing more. Uh, other purchase services includes a number of items, including evictions, including um, just a number of miscellaneous services that we provide here in town that doesn't really have a home. There's a list of them in the book. Uh, community events, there's um, first aid training, um, there is um, uh, costs associated with 31 Enoch Drives. Most of you know what that is. Town has a property on Enoch Drive that we have to share the cost of snow removal and other things related to that. It's a private road. Um, so that's, that's basically the highlights of the budget, but the selectmen, the big item there is the legal fees. Okay. <coughs> Any questions on board of selectmen? All right, probate court, that's pretty standard, right? Yep. 
it hasn't really changed. Natural, yeah. It hasn't really changed in the past four or five years. And just for everybody out there, <laughs> where is our probate court and who is the probate judge? You don't know. I don't know who the, the <laughs> probate judge or the, the probate court is. Um, it's a Derby Regional Probate Derby, Court. Derby, right? Yeah. Clifford Hoyle. It is Clifford Hoyle? Hoyle? Yeah, it's right. his son. Okay. Oh, okay. Judge Hoyle's son. He's we should get them to run the school. He swore us all in. Yeah. He swore us in. We met him. <laughs> we got to swear. He swore at us last year. Yeah, yeah they, they've been pretty years consistent. Ago. Two years ago. All righty. General administration. I'm assuming there's no questions on that. Which is primarily insurance. That's the whole right. budget. Right, pretty much insurance and get natural gas for the town hall are the two items that are increasing. Uh, insurance, we're still uh, a ways away from an information a number, final number on that. So um, that's just an estimate. We'll have more of a refined figure as we get closer to the uh, preliminary budget hearing. I would say the um, increase in cyber insurance is, of course, always a hot topic in the insurance world. As indicated by Sean earlier, the uh, more protections you have, the more um, the things you do to um, guard against a cyber attack, the less your insurance is. So, uh, some things are required, other things are recommended. But it's definitely a fast-growing field for sure. Uh, and and in the umbrellas, um, I believe another area that's um, a little higher this year. I will point out the office supply. We're trying really hard to reduce the number of, aside from this particular budget book, we're trying to reduce the number of amount of paper we use. Include, that's including in the new budget program, where um, we have to make one less book here. Yeah. Or two less, actually. Uh, and so we're oh, trying okay. to um, uh, really reduce the amount of paper just we use generally in town hall. So even though the price is going up, we're hopeful that we won't exceed that budget. Okay, any questions on general administration? All right, the center, 1190. That's basically utilities. Okay. <coughs> Same thing. Yep. Up. Electric is actually going down. Hmm. Um, we paid off some, um, we had done some improvements. For those loans? Right, correct. So that's finally paid off in that building, and uh, but the uh, natural gas is going up. Okay. Um, <coughs> Board of Finance. Da, da, da. That's, that's us. Again, explain why that number is so high. So um, the um, let me pull up, get up right here. The uh, Board of Finance um, contingency is. Uh, increased because we are in contract negotiations and so uh, we currently uh, do not have cost of living adjustments in any department budget so this is just an estimate for um, what uh, funds we may need for the upcoming budget. Tony I have a question about that. I, um, if that's containing all uh, salary increases across the board or whether things like I think I can remember in the recreation budget because minimum wage was going up. Did they build in minimum wage there? is already in the department? <coughs> yeah, this got is that just already. cost of living. So we would see changes mm -hmm. there. Correct. And this is basically the raise year over year. Correct. That we might provide. It's, okay. it's not just. It's. I wouldn't say it's just a cost of living adjustment. It's. Um, we're going into contract negotiations. There are many factors. Mm -hmm. not just cost of living that are involved in a contract and this is for that purpose in addition to um, typical contingency items like snow removal and um, other related items it's not a one-to-one -one relationship but that's why it's it's a little higher this year yeah. it's just you know anything on that <coughs> okay Medical services, that's the ambulance service again, contractual, right? Correct. And that is uh, 319,397. Okay. All right. Um, revenue, that's in the front. Uh, revenue. I'm going to hand this out because this is a um, constantly changing item until we get a little.
Harry, it's already in our book. Oh, it's in our book. Okay, got yeah. it in the book. Okay. Yeah. Well, I thought it was different. No, no, it's the same. Yeah, no. Okay, you should already have it in your book then. It's in the book. Yeah, okay. It's in your book. It's in your book. There may be a few people that don't there's have a, a book. There's a revenue tab. So Paul book. probably needs one. Okay. And uh, Sheila needs one. I think that's it. Okay. So um, these are our um, revenue estimates for the year, for the uh, year of 2024. And uh, I'll just go through them. Uh, so we just discussed them here. The first section are the uh, non-current tax revenues. These are essentially the uh, items, the uh, revenue we collect on delinquent interest and prior year property tax collections. It's about a little less than $300,000. Uh, that's pretty consistent and uh, should remain si uh, the same for the upcoming year. Uh, intergovernmental revenue is uh, uh, not going to be released until February 8th. Uh, that's the governor's budget address. So uh, with the exception of the reduction in the special education excess cost grant, which you will see is a reduction there from 194 to 50, that's a significant reduction. That's based on the um, uh, Woodridge Board of Education estimate in their budget. <coughs> uh, other than that, the rest of these are similar until we hear from the governor and we act accordingly. So that changes as the uh, state goes through their pro budget process and they will update you on that as that uh, unfolds. Under department charges, <clears throat> they're pretty similar to, to the current uh, 23 budget. Uh, the um, building permits are up about $50,000 and the um, rec fees are up $12,000. Those are all the uh, department charges that the departments put in their requested budget. Um, so uh, those are pretty similar. Uh, we do see a significant interest income increase based on our current rates and what our projection is. Uh, we'll see how the Fed reacts and if they raise rates further, uh, we can always adjust that number upward if, we're, um, if we feel necessary. So we could have some possibility of an increase there. Uh, I mean, sorry, can I just ask one quick question? Sure, yeah. Under the departmental charges, yeah. I, still, I see the pool rental is still in there? Yes. That assumes the uh, pool will be back online. <laughs> it's similar to the uh, expenditures. Okay. Yeah. So um, if, if that's not the case, you can adjust the expenditures and the revenue. Uh, under other revenues, <clears throat> I think the big uh, adjustment here is the town is no longer receiving a check for Amity surplus funds. So you will see that the um, an item is eliminated is currently in the current year $611,000, and that's eliminated to zero. Instead, uh, what they are doing is uh, reducing a payment <coughs> of the town. So um, that's about what, 180,000 you said roughly? Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's a, that combined with <coughs> the fact that we have a current $130,000 surplus in the current budget because of the, um, the fact that the uh, town budget was higher than was ultimately adopted by, 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 the, by the, through the referendum process. <clears throat> that, that, that means we have an, essentially a little over $300,000 in funds coming from Amity one way or another, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. right. So Tony, it's not here on this sheet. So well, that's why I increased the fund balance contributions from 400 to 800. Oh, okay. Because essentially those funds are gonna go in our fund balance because they'll be coming to us before the close of the fiscal year. Right. So I increased the fund balance to account for it. So we're still using the Amity funds to offset taxes. It's just presented in a different way. And this will be the one year where... Well, we'll, we'll see, see what happens. This is the one year we have the... Well, depend, we'll see what happens. The same thing could happen this year. Yeah, so ideally we want the same thing to continue to happen so we don't have to guess every year, right? We right. Do, this, we would this, like some stability, right? This, this way here, there's stability... Um, but you, you, you know, you still have to react when you see what happens with surplus. Right. So it you'll still have happen. that issue. Correct. Okay. So, yeah. at least it helps to offset a little of the, um, <laughs> and then the last line is, uh, revenues received from police private duty. 
which uh, offset the uh, payroll expenses related to that activity that we have in our benefits section. So it's an, basically an offset. Okay, any questions on revenue? All right, well, needless to say, when we started this endeavor, Tony told us that all the department requests um, equal close to a 10% increase, which we all know will not happen. But in the weeks to come, start thinking about some items that you heard about that you might want to talk about. And um, of course, that includes all the capital requests, which we never get even close to all of them. But there's a lot of budgets in here that we have to talk about. And we'll talk about, so. The Board of Selectmen will get the first crack at it the other day. February 21? 21st, correct. 21, yep. And we're March something or other? March 2nd? Right. So the Board of Selectmen will refer, refer their numbers to us, the Board of Finance, and then we will move on from there to hopefully come up with a, um, a uh, set of figures to present to the uh, preliminary budget hearing in April 18th or something like that. April 24th, 24th, right? 24th, yeah. So we have our work cut out for us, certainly. So we'll be seeing you in the future. It's been an absolute pleasure spending these evenings with you. I mean, I just can't think of anything I'd rather do. You'd rather be in person than in the But yeah, here you go.